Okay, today we talk about the uh, CMOS manufacturing process uh, with some more details about how uh, integrated circuits are, are made from the circuit design to the actual um, silicon chip. Uh, you can see that um, almost all of the things that I will uh, talk about are, are taken from chapter two of the Rabbi Chandrakasan and Nikolic, which is also available here at the uh, library. There are two things that we will discuss today. One is uh, actually um, the, 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 the fabrication steps for obtaining a complete integrated circuit. And the main uh, way that allow to uh, translate the information that are pre the information that is present in a complete circuit design onto a chip is a set of optical masks. Because as I already mentioned, and we will see in more detail today, uh, <clears throat> the manufacturing process is a photolithographic process. So you need optical masks in order to, let's say, um, pattern the surface of uh, the silicon chip, silicon dye in general. We, we, the, the manufacturing is done wafer by wafer. So we, we shall see that the set of optical masks is uh, a key uh, tool. And the other thing that we will discuss in uh, in, in less detail, but, but somewhat, is this design rule set. Because we have now two different uh, uh, types of professionals. We have the CQ designer that has, or a group of CQ designers that have completely designed a, a logic chip, a microprocessor, for example. Then we have the process engineers that are in charge of the fabrication. And there's a way uh, for them to, uh, let's say, to communicate, to agree on what can and cannot be done. And uh, uh, this passes from, this conversation passes from the design rule set. So also the, the set of design rules is a key instrument because typically what happens is that the CK designer is only interested in performance and would like to have everything as, comp as, uh, as compact as possible. On the other hand, the process engineers are mostly concerned with reliability and with yield, the, the percentage of functioning chips over all the fabricated chips. So uh, typically there's a trade-off here because the more you try to push performance or to make the, the circuit more compact, uh, the higher the probability that something does not work so that you have yield problems or reliability problems. Um, <clears throat> let's start for, from the uh, fabrication process. And uh, we, we can um, start with this illustration, is a, a CMOS inverter, a cross-section, in a very, very simple CMOS process. It's a process which is very old. It's, uh, I would say, something like uh, 20 years old. Okay. This type of process is called N-well. Let me just make some annotations. This is an N well process because there is a well which has an N doping, so a donor type of doping. The N well is this, this region. So the, well, the N well is a region in which the PMOS is fabricated. So basically, this is the wafer cross section.
the wafer is of course made of silicon slightly p-doped so doped as an with an acceptor doping and therefore on the substrate uh, directly the NMOS transistor can be fabricated this is the NMOSFET you can see here we have a P this is a P a P body then we have the source and the drain this is the drain this is the source of the P of the NMOSFET this this black rectangle here is the gate and this gray area here is the dielectric you should recognize every piece so uh, we, we, we won't look in the in the sequence of uh, fabrication steps now but just at the final shape you can recognize here the channel length this is L the source region this is the contact of the source this is a metal contact then you have here the drain region the, the, the M plus region of the drain and the metal contact and the gate here then this part this is silicon oxide is an insulator this is called field oxide because it uh, its role is to insulate two different devices, separate and provide insulation to two, electrical insulation to two different devices, the N MOSFET on the left and of course the P MOSFET on the right because we are looking at a CMOS inverter, you have an N MOS and a P MOS. Oh, the, the, in the 90s uh, the field oxide has this, had this type of shape, this shape was the result of a so-called locus process, but it's, it's uh, let's say, it's only a detail here, locus process. Now, if you want to fabricate, if we want to fabricate the P-MOSFET, we need an N region for the body of the device. Since the substrate is of P-type, we have this N-well. This is the reason for which we have the N-well. We need to dope a wide region which will contain the complete P MOSFET. And typically this doping is done by putting here donors in a percent in a concentration that was higher than the previously present acceptors so that one can change the type of semiconductor from a P substrate to an N well. And then when we have this the, the structure is similar to the NMOS, but we have the drain and the source re region, they're P plus and P plus groups. Then these uh, lines here are the metal contacts. Again, this is the gate, and this thin layer here is the gate dielectric. This is, a, is one of the most simple uh, CMOS process and since it is very simple uh, I, I mean, it's good to, to look at it as, as the first type of process we consider because of course things have become more complicated now. You remember probably the uh, circuit of the inverter you see you have the drain here the drain here the source and the source and this is VDD so which means that this, these two drains will be connected to the output so this is just a cross-section in practice they will be connected to the output this source the source of the N MOSFET will go to ground This, the source of the P MOSFET will be connected to VDD. The two drain will be connected together to the output. And of course, the two gates will be connected on the back of this cross section together to the input. Yeah, but so in this cross section, we are cutting here, 
essentially, in the middle across the P MOSFET and the N MOSFET. <coughs> These type of processes are still used, okay? Because even if, uh, uh, actually we did some design with these processes because especially for analog applications when you do not need uh, high performance, but for example you need low noise operation and so on, uh, they can be very convenient because now they are extremely cheap. All the capital expenses that went into the fabrication of the fab in the 90s have been already, let's say, reabsorbed and therefore uh, you only pay for the running cost. The, the process can be extremely cheap. For this reason, this type of old CMOS processes are used in lots of cheap applications. Uh, cheap and reliable applications. For example, all the smart cards, all the uh, identification chips, uh, several automotive ele uh, electronic chips are made with, uh, with these old processes. Typically they are uh, 0 0.35 micron and up. 0 0.5, 0 0.35 you find this N1 process. Okay. Let's look now at a process a bit more modern, not the most modern one, just to have a, let's say, um, have an idea at least of the differences. Then we start to explore each particular step. So this is a more modern CMOS process. It's called dual well, because there is a P well and an N well, and trench isolated. Trench in Italian is uh, trincea, literally, and uh, is the um, type of isolation, of insulation that is used. In the previous, if you look at the previous process, you had these this, uh, regions. This is a low cost process. And you can see you have this very uh, uh, soft edge, smooth edges of the, of the oxide, which, uh, I mean, uh, actually occupy much more space. Instead, in the, in the more modern CMOS process, you have the insulation in this yellow region here. You have very steep edges, and therefore you can make everything much more compact. So, from low cost to trench isolation. And then we have a dual well, because there is an N well, as we had before. This is the N well which is again for the P MOSFET. Also this is a CMOS inverter, exactly as the one before. But then here you have also a P well. What's the advantage of doing this process? Of course, this is more complicated, but the problem with the, um, the advantage, let's look in a positive way, the advantage of the P-well is that you can have all the N MOSFETs that have the body uh, at different voltages. Because, if you, because all, the P -MOSFET, all the N MOSFETs are um, in independent. Uh, one from the other, you have different. You can have different body voltages. In the other, in the other case, just to see the comparison, the body of the N MOSFET was the substrate, so all the N MOSFETs were at the same, had the body at the same voltage. In this case, the P well is a, has a let's say has a, has a good doping and is a good conductor, and then this PAP is almost an insulator. If you have another N MOSFET, it can have a completely different body. So, different 
body uh, voltage for the and MOSFETs. So it's a good uh, degree of freedom for the designer. The other uh, significant uh, difference, uh, you can see the colors here are a bit different, but the other significant difference is this, uh, this part. You see this uh, uh, violet uh, part here that I underlined. You, you, you can see the um, notation here. This is um, titanium silicide. Titanium silicide, and in the case of the poly gate, it goes above the poly. In the case of the source and drain regions, it goes between the, the silicon and the metal here, and it improves the conductance. It's basically it has metal properties, so it's a very good conductor, and it proves the conductance of the silicon onto which it is uh, deposited. And I mean, the, the, the real advantage is that it can improve speed because it improves the conductance. So improves conductance. of silicon, of doped silicon, silicon contact regions, contact regions. Okay. For the rest, more or less, the, the structure is, uh, is the same as we have seen before. Okay. Now let's look at the, at the different steps. And let's try to understand that, the mo that, that when we, um, you should consider that when we look at CMOS fabrication, we're considering a very expensive process, an extremely expensive process, that can produce very cheap integrated circuits because of the extremely high number of uh, chips that are fabricated at the same time. So the process is expensive, but there is a high parallelism, so the cost per integrated circuit can be low. Uh, you, you should consider that, that, for example, a modern fabrication facility, complete fabrication facility, is now in excess of $5 billion. And this is the reason why fabrication now is uh, uh, let's say, is done in, for the most advanced processes in uh, uh, very few places. And let's say in the industry, we are observing now uh, many uh, mergers because very few players are able to, let's say, put uh, something like $5 billion on a single fabrication facility. So the parallelism is extremely important. Without parallelism, there's no no, no money, basically, because the, the cost of each single integrated circuit would be too expensive. Okay, I uh, can go on now. Let's uh, just to to uh, to connect what we say here to what I said at the beginning. Uh, this is, for example, a design, a circuit design, very simple. We have an inverter in cascade with another inverter. So the output of the first drives the, the second inverter. And then in order to fabricate this simple circuit, we have to translate this into, uh, uh, let's say, something similar to what we have seen before. The, the, the different wells and the different regions that make the two uh, MOSFETs for one inverter and the other two for the other inverter. How do we give the instructions to the fabrication facility? Typically, we have to provide a set of instructions for fabricating optical masks. 
And this set of instructions is called layout, which is uh, basically the map of the uh, circuit that will be fabricated. The map is provided in different colors because there are different masks that will be used to fabricate the chip. And for example, this is the layout. Okay, this is the layout that corresponds to the circuit that I've just shown you. These are two inverters. I probably you do not recognize them, but this is the first inverter. This is the second inverter. This is, this is easy because they have the same shape, right? Let's see if we can recognize it. This is the input. The input goes to the two gates. One gate, this is the gate of the PMOS. And this is the gate of the NMOS. And now we are looking from above. This uh, purple uh, region here is the polysilicon region of the gate. The polysilicon is very uh, strongly doped, so it is also used as an interconnect. Then this blue line here is the conductor which carries VDD, the supply voltage. This is the conductor which carries the ground. Uh, these black squares are the contacts. So, uh, this is the drain and this is the source region of the P-MOSFET. This is the drain and this is the source region of the N-MOSFET. The drain and the drain are connected by this blue line. This is a metal interconnection. So this is the output of the first um, inverter, which is provided as an input to the second. And, then, and this is the output of the second, of course. Now probably you can you, you, you can see it better, but uh, I mean at the end of this hour I think it will be much more clear. Just I wanted to give you uh, let's say uh, a complete view of what we are going to pass, and then we are passing the structure, the pattern of each color, because each color is going to correspond to one set of optical masks that will be used in the photolithographic process. Uh, you should. Uh, see some of the relevant quantities of the transistors. For example, this, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this purple line is the gate, so this is the gate length and therefore is the channel length. And uh, as you can see, that is the minimum feature size that you have in the circuit. This is again L and they are equal. And you also can see that this other dimension is the width <coughs> of the device, of the N-MOSFET, and this is the width of the P-MOSFET. And, and the P-MOSFET is wider than the N-MOSFET because we have to have compensated inverters, balanced inverters. So we need to have the P transistor that is wider than the N transistor because the mobility of holes is smaller than the mobility of electrons. Okay, now le le let's make some some other uh, considerations. Uh, no, I only want to, to stress a bit these black squares. You, you see here this is the drain, the drain region. You have to connect the drain region with the metal, and in order to connect the two, you have to, to, to create some contacts, and therefore you have these black squares. And in, in all the cases in which you have black squares, you're, what you're trying to do, you are connecting electrically two layers that are one on top of the other. And uh, as we shall see, in order to make a connection, you have to open a hole. And this is the reason why 
we have this black square. Okay, let's go it now step by step. Now we jump back and we uh, discuss again each step. Okay, we start from the silicon ingot. Uh, you have seen it in the in the video yesterday. So according to uh, present day technology, the standard diameter is 12 inches, which is 30 centimeters. Um, there are plans to go to 450 millimeters for, for, for 45 centimeters to improve uh, the, the parallelism, basically. But then uh, uh, things have become more and more expensive. So since uh, a few years, the industry is at 300 millimeter, millimeters wafer. Uh, this is a high uh, one and a half meter, uh, typically, and the total weight is uh, of about 100 kilos. So uh, the, the main property of this, uh, you, you know that silicon is a very common material, is everywhere, in the sand, uh, the, 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 the sea sand is the, is the easiest um, source of silicon. The point is for uh, electronic applications you need to have a pure silicon ingot at, uh, with a very high degree of purity so the fabrication process is not easy at all and is, it is pretty expensive. When you have the ingot you then cut it into um, uh, into, into wafers uh, like this, and each wafer therefore has a, a diameter of 30 centimeters and typically a thickness of less than one millimeter. So you really, with a cut, can obtain a large number of pieces. They are called wafers. And the wafers are processed at the same time. Basically, all the fabrication processes occur at least at the level of a whole wafer. Sometimes of, the, of a batch of between 25 and 50 wafers, as I mentioned yesterday. Now, you will see that everything that I will discuss basically has the same structure that is given by a photolithographic process. The, the photolithographic process has this function before we go into the, the details of the step. Uh, before we do any processing step, so doping or uh, let's say um, depositing some layer or, or something else, we need to define in which regions we do the process and which, in which regions we do not do the process. And we use these masks to decide which parts of the wafer, to, to mask some parts of the wafers. This optical mask do exactly this, masks some part of the wafers. So the process occurs only in the parts of the wafers that are not masked. So before we do any process, we need to do this photolithographic step in order to, uh, let's say, mask some regions. And this is done in the following way. First, we start from here. First, there is an oxidation step, which means that a thin layer of oxide is deposited at about 1,000 uh, 1, degrees Celsius over the whole wafer. Then we go in this direction, and some photoresist uh, coating is uh, spinned over the uh, the total surface of the wafer. This is a complete wafer. Okay, it's a, it, it, it's also called the lacca. It's a very um, thin layer of uh, uh, typically um, um, <coughs> uh, 
I'm missing the word now. Yeah. Okay, missing the word. Okay. Then we have the mask. Now the mask has a size which is, uh, let, let's say, in principle, as large as the as the wafer. This was true for the very small wafers. Now the mask typically covers only a part of the wafer, and then we move the mask along the wafer in order to, let's say, uh, pass it over the whole wafer surface. And then when we have the mask and we have the photoresist on the wafer, we do a stepper exposure, which is uh, uh, an illumination with ultraviolet light of the wafer passing through the mask so that we, uh, let's say, project the image of the mask over the wafer. Uh, what happens is that light has uh, an effect on the photoresist. Uh, depending on the type of photoresist, uh, uh, some photoresist can become, it, it, it was soluble, uh, soluble in, 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 in water, for example, or in other solution, and becomes not, it becomes insoluble after exposure to light or the reverse. But the, the important part is that after the exposure, we have some regions of the photoresist that uh, are not uh, soluble, and uh, some regions that are. And therefore, we can develop the photoresist. So wash the photoresist. The regions that are soluble will go away. The other regions will remain, and then we'll cover the, we'll mask the structure that we want to save from the process step. Okay? You have seen the animation, it goes exactly in, 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 in this way. We can define, for example, the region in which we want to create the, the, the well and dope the, the, the silicon substrate underneath and so on. Okay, this, uh, after the development, uh, uh, then, okay, I, I, I'm just here. Uh, after the development, basically, we wash everything and we arrive here. So at this structure, we are ready to make the process step. And then here we have the process step and can be different. We can do a doping. We can, uh, let's say, <coughs> deposit some oxide only in some regions and not in other and so on. Okay, we, we shall see what are the possibilities. But th this whole part serves to mask some particular regions of the wafer. Then we do the process, and then we have to remove the residual photoresist. We, 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 this is, now we will remove everything, and then we can start again by defining the second, uh, the, let's say, the, the, the regions for the second mask and for, therefore the second process step. So we go in circle in this way, and we do a complete circle for each process step. Of course, you can uh, understand that uh, uh, the situation is so, is so um, sensitive to, to dirt and to dust that we need to do the, the complete operation in a so-called clean room. The clean room that is used for this type of operation are, is in class 1 to 10, depending on the operation. And for example, just to, to understand the, 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 the degree of, uh, of uh, cleanness, if we have a clean room in class 1, it means that there is less than one dust particle per cubic foot. And so the clean rooms are the, 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 those environments that you have seen in the video in which you see people completely covered with the, uh, uh, special um, special coat, uh, something on the head, uh, special shoes. The, these, these people have to change every time they enter into the clean room and, and they have to, 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 to leave their clothing inside after operating in the clean room. And this is important because a dust particle which goes onto the wafer can completely 
let's say, make a usable chip because, of course, the dust particle masks the operation, therefore you have several transistors that are not defined as you want them to be defined and nothing works. So in order to have a high yield, you need to have a very clean room. <coughs> and this is, of course, part of the, of the reason the cost of, the, um, of a fab is, is so high, because in order to I mean, because the, the air conditioning and the air circulation to have a clean room has to be extremely, extremely uh, sophisticated. Okay, what are, uh, so what's the final result? You have something like this. This is a 30 centimeter wafer. And you can see you have hundreds of chips. These are large microprocessors. But of course, even a large microprocessor has a die that is at most two centimeters by one. In a, in a circle with 30 centimeters of diameter, you can put hundreds of them. So the, pro, the, the process is very, um, the fabrication process has a high parallelism. You go wafer under wafer, and you fabricate hundreds of microchips at the same time. Uh, yeah. The process is not extremely fast because in order to fabricate a complete chip it takes uh, 30 40 days because you need to have you have hundreds of steps and therefore you have and you have some times some necessary times from one step to the other but then but of course the throughput can be very high because everything is done in pipeline and therefore the production can be extremely high This is a zoom of the same part. This is a core i5 from Intel. OK. Now, uh, uh, let's uh, see the same thing for a particular process step so that we can, let's say, recollect the whole uh, sequence and see if we have uh, uh, understood everything. We we'll start from here. This is the silicon substrate. Let's assume that this is just a cross section of the wafer, just silicon. Okay. Then, as we said before, we first oxidize. We put a layer of silicon oxide on top. Then we put the photoresist, the lacca, on top. And then we put the mask, which is here, and the UV light. The part of the resin, that is, the, the, the mask has some regions that are opaque and some regions that are transparent. Okay. Of course, the light passes through the regions that are transparent and impresses the photoresist. So these green regions are the regions in which the photoresist is exposed. So let's assume that uh, the exposed part becomes hardened and therefore is not soluble anymore. You, uh, you, you uh, apply some, uh, uh, let's say, easy etching, which can be chemical or, or, or plasma. We shall see in some more detail how this happens. And uh, only the part of the photoresis that are not exposed are removed so that you have actually defined the pattern on top of the wafer. Now you can apply the, pro, uh, the, the process that you want. For example, you want to etch, which means you want to cut a hole in the layer in order to, to do that you need to, to make some type of uh, um, you need to, let's say, attack uh, silicon oxide, for, for example, with some uh, acid solution. But only the parts that are not, that are not covered by the resist uh, are actually attacked so that you can define a hole in the middle of the silicon oxide layer. After that, you can remove the hardened resist with a different type of solution. And this is your final result. You have defined 
a hole in the, in the silicon side, which can be useful to make a metal contact on the silicon uh, or, or for other things. So this part is the same for any, all the steps except for E, no E, for, for uh, sorry, the, the part of the process is this one. This one is the process. This is the result uh, after the process. Okay, this also is the process. Okay. So all the parts of regarding the photolithographic process, the exposure of the photoresist are identical for any process step. You only change the process step depending on what you want to do. And then you repeat. You, you, at the end you polish everything, you, you rinse, and then you repeat. course you have the slides you will have the slides at the end and you also have the the, the, the chapter of uh, I was mentioning before so that you can find everything well written so <coughs> let's see if everything is is uh, clear no before we we go into the the analysis of all the possible processes is better to uh, stop and make a uh, short break. <clears throat>